Have you ever asked yourself the question, how did I end up here? Now, you could have asked yourself in a practical way, like, why am I sitting in this auditorium on a Sunday evening? <laughs> or it could be sort of a life, big life question. Like, how did I end up in this life? Maybe the answer to that made you feel good and appreciative. Maybe it made you feel sad and angry. Now, I thought about this question all my life, and so much so that a couple days ago, I was talking to my seven-year-old daughter. And I said to her, I said, uh, I said, sweetie, I said, uh, how do you think daddy ended up in this life? In this wonderful town with three beautiful girls and an amazing wife and all these nice things. And she looked at me with her little doe eyes and she said, aren't you supposed to be just tucking me in right now? <laughs> and yes, I was, and I was delaying that. But the reality is, is while that was cute and funny, it's a question I've taken very, very seriously and asked myself um, frequently all my life. Because you see, when you are born into poverty, on the lowest rung on the ladder, and you find yourself near the top, you ask yourself, how did I end up here? When no one in your family knew anyone who went to college, let alone um, went them themselves, and you now teach at one, you ask yourselves, how did I end up here? And when you spent too much time as a kid hiding under your bed in fear of who would enter your room, and you now stand here on the stage as an adult with confidence, you ask yourself, how did I end up here? It's a question that I think is an important one to ask ourselves for a lot of reasons. I think it can change how we see ourselves, but also how we see other people. Now, when I reflect on my own journey, it can be summarized in a very simple way, in a way that's very familiar to, you know, the American dream. Two words, hard work. And it goes something like this. My mom was a bartender, and raised three kids on her own because she worked hard. I went to school and I worked hard. I got into college and I worked harder. I got my first job. I continue to work hard. I started my own company. I worked hard. I worked hard to write a book. I worked hard. And now here I am in that lovely town with three amazing kids, a beautiful wife, and nice things. So why do I feel so much anger and guilt? I feel anger because during this journey, I saw other people who just didn't seem to have to work as hard. I felt guilty because I knew people who I had left behind, who didn't have the same advantages or opportunities that I had. And I knew there was something that was missing. Hard work did not tell the story in a complete way. Because if I was honest with myself, I know that I did not work any harder than my mom who toiled behind that bar night after night. I did not work any harder than my brother who spent the last 30 years on the factory line at Harley-Davidson. I did not work harder than my sister who drives an 18-wheel tractor trailer across the country, despite the fact that she has lupus. I didn't work harder than a lot of my friends who have suffered different life outcomes. Some who were sick, some in prison, and some even dead. So I had to go on a journey for myself to understand how can I stop feeling so angry and guilty and how can I make sense of all this? So I'm going to pause for some cool science. <laughs> so the first thing I did is I went around the country and I've been very fortunate both in person and online to have conversations and listen to thousands of Americans talk about their dreams and their struggles and their obstacles. I read all the research that there was around social mobility. What really does contribute to how some people move up and some people don't? And most importantly, I sort of understood the psychology behind how we think about where we end up, where we do. And I want to share three things with you. The first is, the reality is there's two lives we live. There are the facts of our lives, like what literally happened, and there's how we remember our lives, the stories we tell ourselves. And what's more important? It's the way we remember our lives. There are the headwinds in our lives, those things that sort of push us back, those obstacles we all face. And there's the tailwinds, those things that help propel us forward. What do we remember more? The headwinds. And finally, I've learned that hard work trumps everything. Research will tell you that people think it is the number one thing that's important for achieving greatness or moving up in life. That it can overcome any obstacle, abuse, bad childhood, etc. We've seen it from Rocky to Rudy and every story in between. It's a truth that we believe. 
So I wanted to try to understand what was the rest of my story? Who were my tailwinds? What beyond my hard work contributed to where I was? The rest of my story, I have to sort of pause and apologize because I've been told that the cardinal rule of PowerPoint slides is no more than six words. <laughs> my bad. You see, I think that it's okay to have rules for slides, but not rules for how we describe our lives. And in essence, this is my dream team. This is how I got here. If you take any one name off of there, I'm not here. John McKinnon comes from Scotland, Nova Scotia, ultimately to Boston starting in 1840. He doesn't make that voyage, I'm not here. My mom, Daytona Roth, not only was she great and she provided, but she was a buffer. That's a psychological term that meant that she kept me away from some of the abuse and bad things around me and helped make sense. If I think about people maybe I didn't even know, for example, Joan Gans Cooney. I didn't know who she was, but she started Sesame Street to make sure that I didn't start kindergarten behind. My family gave me the nickname The Little Professor. Sounds silly enough, but that nickname set the expectation that I could go to college. When we think about other people on this list, I have to acknowledge right in the middle it says, if you didn't notice, that I am white and I am a male. And the reality is those do have certain advantages. And if I'm neither, I have to ask myself, am I still here? Now there are other people, Claiborne Pell. Claiborne Pell invents the Pell Grant. He doesn't do that, I can't afford to go to college. I'm not here. Jack Downs was a fifth grade teacher of mine, took me under my wing during a very difficult time. He doesn't do that, I'm not here. And finally, two Iraqi brothers in England start a company. Then they open an office in New York. If they don't do that, I don't get my first job, I don't move up the ladder, I don't meet my amazing wife. And so, not only am I not here, but my three kids aren't either. And the reality is, the act of sitting down and writing all of these names down was profound. But you still may say, so what? Why do you care about my story? Well, the reality is there was another piece of research that showed all of those other things I mentioned before can be combated with one simple thing, the act of reflection, the act of asking ourselves, how did I end up here, by going through that journey. So for me personally, what that has meant is that the anger and the guilt, they're gone. They're replaced by appreciation and compassion, and most importantly, a desire to make my name on as many lists as possible, to be part of someone else's dream team. But beyond me, I've also seen professionally what that means in the lives of others. I've seen stories of a CEO who reflects on her journey up the corporate ladder and upon doing so, raises the wages for all of her employees. I've seen the story of a correction officer who previously had abused the people in his care, reflect on his own experience as a foster child, and now instead of abusing them, he's protecting them. And then, of course, there's our politicians. Politician reflects on his life in poverty and the shame he felt and goes on to create the war on poverty to help millions move up. This power of reflection is limitless. The ability for us to change the way we see ourselves and the way we see others. Now today, we're having a lot of important debates around inequality, around needing to sort of instill more grit in people, or to check our privilege, or to be more empathetic. These are all important concepts and ideas. But they're all externally focused, what someone else should do, how you should feel about someone else. And they're also divisive. Mention any one of these concepts and you'll turn people off, instead of asking ourselves to look in. Now, one definition of empathy is to put yourself in someone else's shoes. I would argue that we first need to put ourselves in our own shoes. Now, this is an admittedly corny ask, so please bear with me, but I want you to look at your shoes. Hopefully, you've worn your Sunday finest. <laughs> but now I want you to continue looking at them, and I want to imagine who was there when you took your first step? Who was there when you fell and helped you up? Who was there that walked you down the aisle to graduation or your wedding? Who helped you walk into that first job? Now, at first blush, it may be like, well, I was by myself. But think again.
Who had to make those steps possible? Now, when we think about this sort of question, we think about our shoes and the steps we walk and the people that we help us, I do that in a way just to sort of provide something very sort of simple for all of you. A prompt. I started with the question, how did I end up here? But the question is for you to ask yourselves, how did you end up here? Who is on your dream team? Who, if they, you took them from your lives, you're not where you are today? The more often we ask that question as individuals, as a society, the better off we will be. Thank you.